Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, New York Community Bank, m and Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, AmTrust Title, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding has been provided by AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Collier's International NYC, Collins Building Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handrow Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Meringhoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. Legal Eagles, they are the advisors, they're the counselors, they're the people who really give opinions of counsel of what they should do. They represent banks, they represent owners, they represent landlords, they are bankers, they're in different areas. So today I've assembled four of the New York City's prominent Legal Eagles to provide their view on the market. My guests include Richard Fries, partner at Sidley Austin, the tax certiorari king of the city of New York. Joel Marcus, the senior partner and founder of Marcus and Bollock. The youngest member of our group over here, the partner at Gustin & Stores, Brian Cohn. And last but not least, the senior partner and the man who's responsible for real estate and leasing at Kent Beatty & Gordon, Michael Kent. So, you know, people tell me, uh, Mr. Taxman and tax incentives, that taxes in New York for real estate is going up. Is that true? Yes. They've been going up about 7 to 10 percent a year, every year. But isn't rents going down for office space and retail space and so on? You're right. Rents have plateaued and they're starting to come down. In residential, they're coming down, and we're seeing it come down substantially in retail. But the problem is that with tax escalation clauses and the delay in reporting income and expenses, the trajectory is still increasing. The city also increases values because they're lowering the capitalization rates, and so lesser income is still producing greater market value. You know, you brought up very interesting in the green room that if somebody owns a one, two, or three family home, it's a great opportunity. They, they ta their real estate taxes are lower than somebody who might be in a cooperative or a condo. That's right. You, The freeze established by the legislature starts in 1981. They can only increase it 6% a year. And what happens is you could have a townhouse that sells for $30 million, but they can only increase it 6%. But what if the townhouse was recently built? Now you pay the full value. Ah, so you have to truly have a brownstone, which is an older thing. Also in, in the green room, I heard from Mr. Fries that um, the real estate market is great. Why do you think the market is so positive these days? Uh, well, firstly, it's, a, it's an enduring asset class. Uh, we can touch it, we can feel it, we can take great pride in real estate, 
And one of the things that makes real estate so enduring is it's a very financeable asset. There's a tremendous amount of debt that is chasing a very finite amount of real estate. When you roll back 20 years, there was a traditional lender and there was a traditional borrower. There was no such thing as a debt fund, no such thing as a debt fund. Fast forward to today, there are 120 debt funds that are very nimble, they're very agile, they can make executive business decisions on a dime. They don't have to go to credit committees. They can make proceeds available uh, for acquisition, for development, for refinance. They also are unregulated. So you have debt funds, family funds, hedge funds, private equity, making substantial capital available for real estate acquisition and development. It's a very exciting time in those markets. So I'm going to look at the two tr more of the transactional people because you, you represent lenders more often. How do you see it, both of you, on financing today from banks, family offices, debt funds, and so on? Well, I, I, would, I would actually agree with a lot of what Richard um, is saying. Boy, I, I, I wouldn't have agreed. I mean, in this, I, you know, I don't want to in this case, it. since he is representing the lenders and I often represent the borrowers, I do want to agree with him, not just so that he funds in a timely manner, but in addition, I also want to agree that there is, I, there's, a, there's a deeper sophistication in the marketplace, whereas maybe traditionally, um, debt providers stayed in their lane. But now you have family offices and family real estate companies and real estate platforms that are getting in on the debt business. Or you have um, other financial firms that are getting involved in either private equity, real estate, or preferred equity. And now that there's more players in the marketplace, including international players, it's making or it's creating more opportunity for equity to come into more and more complicated transactions. Michael, you're seeing the same situation? Yeah, well, my practice is more in the leasing and in the hospitality field, so I'm not in, as involved with lending, but I think one of the comments made in the green room was that there's just too much money, and it does find a way to work its way down to the people that need it. So yeah, it's a very favorable Are you lending. seeing that, because you represent a lot of developers and new projects, are you seeing a lot of foreign investors being part I'm of it? I'm seeing these? a lot of foreign investors, but I actually see a lot of uh, homegrown investors, but they're coming from places we never heard of. We find people uh, able to finance 200 million in big numbers, and it's coming from uh, vehicles, it's coming from uh, we see uh, Canadian companies investing here in New York, and they're putting up huge projects, some of them over a billion dollars. Now, what effect does a foreign investor have with regard to any effect on the taxes on the property? Fortunately, the, the pricing of the asset or the financing total number does not really change the property tax that's on the property. However, the income levels that are created by creating this new value, they do drive the taxes higher. How do you see retail today with your client base and, and in general? Because as you said, as Joel said before, retail is down, the rents are down. How, and how is it affecting your clients You know, with the, uh, the, the increase in the minimum wage and the other situation? Well, if you look at the restaurant field where I spend a lot of my time, um, although According to the city, there are the same number of uh, permits out for restaurants, which is about 10,200. Uh, that number has been pretty constant for four years. There's been a tremendous turnover in the nature of the restaurants. And what we're seeing is the rents, which we've talked about, uh, are, are killing uh, the restaurant operators. The operating expenses have been going up dramatically. And the labor, you've got a $13 uh, per hour minimum wage right now, which is going to 15. There is talk of dropping the credit for, for the, the tips. Credit, that's right. that's going to kill. You've got a horrible regulatory situation here in New York with um, the inspectors uh, and everything else. The inspectors, uh, activists, community boards. There's a lot of things that, and, and and just the labor laws are so sophisticated and complex. You can run afoul of them without intending to. So it's a very tough situation. And what we're seeing now is that a lot of the operators, the smaller mom and pop, the artisanal the uh, people with great ideas, the people who want to create food, not the, not the chains and so forth. 
they're packing up. They can't stay in business. And what's surprising is when I get calls from certain clients that are operating what appear to be outwardly successful venues, they're packed. They're closing because it's not worth it. So what happens, Michael, is that some of them just pack up and they're done. Others start looking to leave New York. And what we're seeing, and this is a fairly dramatic impact, New York's reputation, which is well-founded as a culinary capital of the United States, is being undermined. And you've got this nationalization of food. And you've got a lot of chefs, you've got a lot of operators that are saying, I don't need this anymore. I'm going to go to Milwaukee, where I grew up, and I'm going to open up there. But, you know, as I brought out in, in the green room, the proliferation of these food halls today, you, you're seeing more and more food halls. And this is a, a question with regard to your thoughts on that and also as a, as a, as a representing a owner. You know, do you want a food hall? What, how do, what's your thoughts? There's two thoughts on food halls. One is that it's, it's fabulous. It's an alternate way of proceeding because the investment is minimal. Uh, you can bring in local people, the artisans, again, the creative people, and they're able to operate with a minimal amount of capital. On the other hand, there's a, a contrasting viewpoint, which is these people are just placeholders until the owners can find a better financed and more permanent tenant. And right now, I think in New York, depending upon your definition of a food hall, there's somewhere between 20 and 25 operating. Right, and they're expecting 50 within the next four to five years. But I, I would actually argue that one of the benefits of a food hall operator is that if, let's say, um, uh, an owner of office buildings, they may have an expertise in filling, and filling their office building, negotiating leases, and truly understand the office market. It's possible that their strength may be in office leasing, but not in retail, and or not in restaurants, which is a very specific thing which you, you, you specialize in. So there is a benefit to being able to, per se, net lease out your entire Right, but I'm going to play this on the banking question and also on the tax question section. As a lender's counsel, I mean, you deal with lenders. Forget the private equity. I'm not certain how the private equity or even how the banks look at because the restaurant business is, you know, you have to depend each and every day. Look, uh, restaurants probably historically and today are the number one failed industry in commerce. So restaurants fail. That is not new. They fail, and it's not necessarily because taxes are high or rent is high. Restaurants are a failed industry. It is a very small slice of retail, and it's a very small slice. The irony of real is estate. today it's becoming a larger slice of retail because many of these retail establishments, which have closed, certain of the credit, their tenants are these, you know, new new restaurants over there and these new food halls or the limited service places. Well, I do think, I do think that as retail right sizes, because retail is shrinking globally, malls are shrinking, malls are becoming obsolete, these are going to become family destination centers. And family destination centers, my prediction, is family destination centers are not going to be what we think about with bowling alleys and ping pong and food, but they're going to be full service, the spectrum, including health care and including daycare. You're going to have destination centers where families are going to want to congregate. And that's how that is going to be part of replacing restaurants or failed retail, which is being completely overtaken by e-commerce but, but you, but you with know, when, destination. When you look at, and there was a survey recently done uh, by Pew and a couple of others. You know, we had 62 million visitors to New York last year. Okay, and many of them go to Times Square where your office is there, and there are people there. And they are producing the revenues for the businesses. They're producing the restaurant revenue. They're producing revenue for the regular retailers. You know, so with all these visitors over here, it should be having a good effect on the economy as opposed to having a bad effect on retail. I mean, new destinations. I recently did a show. There's a new place called Gulliver's uh, Travel, uh, Gulliver's and National or Geographic opened up a location, both in the new, uh, former New York Times headquarters. The Spy Museum opened up, okay? And then, you know, in, in your clients, the related companies, they're building one of these observatories, you know, the observation. The vessel, yes. Right, the vessels, the, the observation hall that they're going to have at Hudson Yards. Those are big items today. 
I think what's happening um, with these food halls is it's almost like the phenomenon that we've seen with WeWorks in the office uh, specialty area. So you have spaces that are available and they fill them up and they're able to have a whole different mixture of people who come in and they're able to occupy the space and as one one may fail and one may be successful and they'll take more space, they can fill in the gaps, but meanwhile most of the space is occupied. What happens with these food halls is you have a, a number of different vendors and a number of different types of food. And so if one of them is not successful, well it represents only like 5% of the space. Right, I so mean many of these them. halls have 16 to 25, okay? And you know, it doesn't really matter. It depends, for example, the Pensy, which is at the One Penn Plaza, they don't have a venting. So they have different type of tenants over there because they can't vent the space. While the new urban uh, space that opened on 51st Street in the file building has a venting so that the restaurants could be over there. You know where there's an interesting area of some retail growth? Is in the, in the developing communities in Brooklyn and Queens where there are small retail spaces for restaurants and, and not your average, you know, sort of chain re retailers to try something out. And the landlords are encouraging that, and the developers are encouraging that because they need to create a, a community and a streetscape. I, I mean, for a all the perfect rentals. example is I know you represented a developer in Long Island City. Mm -hmm. You go into Long Island City, you know, you have fourteen thousand new apartments, and you have a limited amount of retail. Uh, and you need you need places uh, to eat, and you need places to buy your groceries, and other you know other kinds of support for them. And but you look at uh, two two incredibly undeniable facts. Let's say the center of the universe in Manhattan or in Brooklyn is shifting, and if the center of the universe is shifting, for example, to Hudson Yards or to the West Side as opposed to Midtown or the East Side, you do need new, fresh, exciting retail there. And one of the things that we also talked about before, the average real estate cycle is six to seven years, 70 months, 80 months. We're in month 135 mm. of this real estate cycle. There are no defaults. There are, uh, other than retail bankruptcies, the enduring asset class is not defaulting. Money is cheap. It is plentiful. Lenders, to directly respond to earlier, Michael, lenders are throwing their money at income-producing property. If a portion of the income-producing property is retail, they will underwrite that. But, you know, with regard to that, I know Michael, a number of years ago, represented some restaurants in, in the meatpacking district. The meatpacking district, from as you were saying before, when you were, worked at 111 8th Avenue for Citibank, you wouldn't want to be there at 2 o'clock. Then the neighborhood really grew, and now retail rents in the meatpacking district are down. It's a, it's a very difficult area. Yeah. Well, here's the paradox to all of this with neighborhoods. We're running out of neighborhoods to gentrify, so yeah. you see this, this complaint from so many restaurateurs. And you, you look at even the, well, the Upper West Side, Danny Meyer with the Union Square Cafe and the whole Union Square West. People would go in, or Smith Street in Brooklyn. People would go in. Nobody wanted to be there. They would put their capital at risk, they would build up the place, and then more would come, and art galleries and so forth, and it became very hip, whether it's Williamsburg, and then they ended up being priced out because of their own success. Mm -hmm. And that's what we see more and more, and we are running out of neighborhoods to do that in. Talking about Lower Manhattan, okay? You have major developments taking place, you had certain tax advantages taking place. You got retail, but if you go to the Oculus and you see what's going into the place, there are a lot of people going in, but they may not be in the stores. So it's more of a destination. Well, it's like a tourist attraction, and people go there, and we have to see whether or not it becomes a permanent draw. Or it's like, if you think about one of the restaurants, like a Jekyll and Hyde, you know, you go there, it's very interesting, it's great. Did you go there a second time? You probably didn't. So that's one of the things. The other thing is, you know, we have a lot of street vendors uh, and that's having, that has some effect. And we have a certain style of eating lunch. The people go, when we talk about these food halls, people are standing up, they're waiting on lines, and they're buying food. Is this a long-term trend? Or, you know, do people want to sit down? If you want to sit down, how many turns of a table do you get? If you take a map of Manhattan in your mind, and you think of neighborhoods that might have been marginal relatively recently, they are bustling. 
Hmm. Right. There are, there are no bad neighborhoods in New York City today. Exactly you right. Say, you know, anything. Joel brought up an interesting comment before the proliferation of the, uh, the WeWorks. Do you see as a lender, as, you know, as a developer representing Hansel, what's your thoughts of the co-working opp opportunities? I'm not only talking about WeWork, I'm talking about the yard, no tell now, there are other new companies over there. Any thoughts from? You know, it's very interesting because I would have thought when this first concept came about that I, d I didn't think it was a successful concept. They were getting the space relatively inexpensively because there was a lot of surplus space and they were filling it up. But actually, when you look at how much revenue they're getting, they're doing much better. Sure, they're getting land. a higher price it's, per foot. It's, it's brilliant. But it also leads to an evaluation of a word that is becoming extremely overused, densification. And we talk about office space and the fact that office tenants need less space because of hoteling, because of telecommuting, because of remote working. So this concept, this concept of sharing space one way or another as business needs less space is here to stay. That's true. And so they, they're having more people in less space and that's a, that's a negative trend for office. But on the other hand, there's a phenomenon going on which is like an incubator. So you have all of these very young people that are coming in and they, they, did, they chose not to join the big company or maybe the big company didn't want them. So they're there and they have a lawyer and two, two doors down, there's an accountant, there's an architect. And these may be the incubators of a lot of business that may really grow. And that's the one question we don't know. I, mean, I think a lot of people the, figure that if they have um, one of these kinds of, whether it be we, we work or no-tell, that they may be incubating more opportunity, more tenants for this I, I mean, the Millstein specifically at their building on Madison Avenue, uh, has an incubator that they provide for tenants over there. They but you know what's interesting about describing, you know, that, a, that a, a landlord has an incubator within their building, one of the ways to look at that is that landlord has control of the destiny of their building. So one of the challenges that the landlords that I speak with when they're being approached by the WeWork of the world uh, is whether or not, you know, they, they'll, let's say they underwrite it and, uh, you know, apples to apples, whether it's one tenant versus a WeWork, it, maybe the WeWork might look better to them. But they feel like they may be giving up control over their asset by subjecting so much of their asset, leasing so much of their asset to one of these aggregators. So there is something to be said about a, an, an owner who's owned a piece of property, who's owned an office building for generations, to really stop and hesitate before they um, really hand over, if you would think about it, the leasing of a majority of their asset to one of these kinds of organizations. Completely agree from the lender's perspective. From the lender's perspective, there is anxiety about the ephemeral nature of the aggregator and whether today's exciting asset class becomes obsolete and then the lender has lent on an income stream that has just dropped like a rock. So there's anxiety about that. But the wonder of it all is it may work. These yeah, incubators it, may work. Yeah, and you talk about the aggregators. If you look at a WeWork, they seem to be moving away somewhat from that uh, a desk at a time. And they're, they're they doing have an business. enterprise. They're concept. doing business with the Fortune 500, Microsoft, right down the line, Facebook. They're doing floors, multiple floors. So it, it's different. And an owner of a building, I submit, would not be as concerned right. if you're if we work if your aggregator is we work bringing in Microsoft or Facebook that's uh, a pretty good guaranteed flow of revenue and I think we work has gotten to the point where their whole business model it's it's a cultural approach it's not just you know it's not just real estate anymore it's for a, them it's a great model because as you say a lot of companies are coming there and they're saying the, the traditional way everybody has their office and the secretaries are in in the central area etc that that may be gone and so now you have a, a question of what attracts people why is new york city and why are some of the major metropolitan areas the magnet that brings people from all over the country there's a certain amount of excitement and one of these things like we works and, and there are many other uh, copy the yard and uh, yeah. 
and they and they bring in people and they create and they, WeWorks also sells insurance. They do telecasts all over. There's a whole there's a whole right. It's you know if you go back, Regis has been around for years, and Regis went bankrupt originally, and then they're back, and Regis has now been taken over by Brookfield. So the, the companies over there, and I, I think one of the areas which I've brought out recently on my shows is real estate technology has become very big. The, um, uh, we tell the story or we hear the story about Michael Milken and when he had his trading room, his trading room was, a, this goes back 20, 25 years, was a gigantic X. And he had all his traders and his desk, which was the size of this table, his desk was in the middle of the X so that he could pivot and look at every trader all day long. And that was very revolutionary. That is the way it's going to be. Offices are shrinking, walls are shrinking, privacy is shrinking, paper is shrinking, technology is making it. Okay, but amenities are in, in buildings on 6th Avenue who want to attract they're adding amenities. They're, they're adding certain amenities for that millennium worker. They want that type of situation. With, with a short period of time, how do you see the residential market in general? I know you represent a number of them. Sure. I mean, there's still a lot of energy in the residential market. I think Joel can speak to the challenges from a tax perspective, but for the reasons we've discussed, both there's, you know, on, on any given deal that I'm working on, there's somewhere between four and six term sheets from a lender, maybe a few less from an equity provider, but there's still a lot of capital. And particularly if you're building condominium in New York and you're still building for that sort of, um, in that price range of a two bedroom in that, you know, two and a half to three and a half million dollar range, there's still a lot of action. And the same with, um, with rental for multifamily. There's still a lot of energy behind both development and also act, um, trading of, uh, uh, of income producing. And one of the drivers of that is actually the 1031 buyer, which is driving a lot of the, um, a lot of the acquisitions, a lot of the trading uh, in light of the market. Right. You, you know, if the, the tax law we were talking about, about entertainment venues no longer being deductible, the good part was they didn't get rid of the 1031 exchange, which allowed people to make investments. Mm -hmm. So if I had to look at my Apple mm -hmm. and see if it was shiny, it looks pretty good based on the comments of the four legal eagles today. So I'd like to thank Richard, Joel, Brian, and Michael, and I'll see you next week.